My dear friends, as we see in today's gospel passage, Thomas places his finger in the wounds of Jesus, and he believes. As we just heard the gospel proclaimed by the deacon in John 20, verse 27, Easter Sunday, more than 2,000 years ago. Put your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Many call Thomas, St. Thomas, the Doubting Thomas. But all of the apostles doubted. All of the apostles on Holy Thursday night in the Garden of Gethsemane ran away and abandoned Jesus. All of them. In reality, he is not the Doubting Thomas, but I call him the Courageous Thomas. He is the only apostle who knows where to find Jesus. By touching the wounds of Jesus, he begins to understand that the risen Jesus is not a ghost, but that he is truly real. By encountering the wounds of Jesus, he is able to encounter the authentic Jesus, the real Jesus, and the whole Jesus. Because he is able to encounter the Jesus that shed his blood on, on the cross on Good Friday, he falls to the ground and pronounces a profound act of faith. My Lord and my God. Thomas is able to encounter Jesus in all of his humanity and in all of his divinity. He comes to grasp with the reality that the risen Jesus is the same Jesus that died on Calvary. And so, when we see Jesus now risen from the dead, with his glorified body, he keeps in his body the wounds. Why weren't the wounds of the nails and the spear healed as he miraculously rises from the dead with the resurrected body, the glorified body? Why does he still have his wounds? And why does he tell Thomas to put his finger into his wounds? Obviously, Jesus is teaching us something. What lesson then is he teaching us by keeping his wounds intact? First of all, if we look at ourselves, if we look at all of humanity, we all experience the large wound that we all share, called original sin. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, the first sin, we are all wounded. We have a dark, even though we're baptized, we, are, we remain with the effects of original sin. We have a darkened intellect, a weakened will, and inflamed passions. And if we don't believe that we have a problem, just remember what happens every morning, every Monday morning, when the alarm goes off early for work and early for school. And then, there are the other wounds, the wounds that are smaller, the wounds that are our own wounds, our own personal wounds. We have wounds that are caused by sickness and the wounds caused by problems, adversities, challenges, and the biggest wound of all is caused by the disappointments of life. All of us are wounded. Even Jesus is wounded. Where then is the center of woundedness for each and every one of us? The center, the very epicenter of our woundedness is in the family. We can find all sorts of woundedness in the workplace. We can find all sorts of woundedness at school. And yes, we even find all sorts of woundedness in the church. But for most of us, if not for all of us, there is no place more wounded than our own family. The wounds within our own family cause immense personal suffering, a suffering that is deep and unending. And why is that the case? We all have friends, and sometimes friends will disappoint us. 
and we usually move on with little effort. We all have co-workers that will disappoint us, and we usually move on with little effort. However, it is almost impossible to move on from suffering from the wounds caused by family members, especially those caused by the immediate family. And why is this so? Why? Because it is our family that we love the most. Every family has crazy people. Sometimes they are so crazy that we can't stand being with them. Sometimes family life is like a circus and we have to learn how to get along, not only with the clowns, but also with the wild animals as well. When family relationships are unhealthy, they hurt. The reason why they hurt is because we care. If we did not care, they would not hurt. The people that we care about the most can hurt us the most. So what is the strategy? Well, some people have such crazy, dysfunctional family situations that they simply, they simply leave. They move to another part of the country, or they leave the country altogether and start over again in Mexico or in Costa Rica. Why do you think there are so many people that are retired in other countries like Costa Rica or Mexico? Because they're done. And they say to their family members, we're out of here. We're done. You want to visit? Come visit. And guess what? They don't visit. So what then is the strategy? We just can't run away from our woundedness. Let us look at Jesus and learn from Jesus. What is, what, what is the strategy that Jesus gives us for the woundedness of the family? Let's just see what he did with his own dysfunctional family. Not Joseph and Mary but the dysfunctional family that he started. The church. The community. The community of believers. The way. The Christians. He built, he started the church on the apostles. The twelve apostles. There's the beginnings of the church. Jesus founded the Catholic Church on the twelve apostles. Not the three stooges, but the, the twelve apostles. But many times the twelve apostles were acting like the three stooges. So what did they, so, and what happened? What did the apostles do? On Holy Thursday night, they all ran away. Everyone left Jesus alone. Just think about the profound suffering that this caused Jesus. Not only because he was left alone by his friends, by his disciples, but most importantly, he was worried about them. And why was he worried about them? Because he loves them. So what did he do? He could have come back into the upper room. This is the room and this is in the, the home of St. Mark's parents. The Last Supper was celebrated there. The apostles went back there thinking that they too would be crucified. And the apostles waited for the Spirit to come together with the Blessed Virgin Mary for the first Pentecost. And so Jesus appears to them on Easter Sunday morning with the glorified body. And he walks through the doors. And what does he say to his family? Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. He didn't yell at them. He didn't scold them. Nor did he give up on them. He could have said, screw this, I'm out of here, I'm going to Mars and starting all over again. But what did he say? Peace be with you. My dear friends, we can't force our crazy family members to change. But we can reach out to them. We can invite them to change. And we can influence them. Even the 12 apostles changed. They were transformed on Pentecost and they fulfilled the mission that Jesus called them to do. And yet, one of the 12 simply did not get it. He didn't get it. And we all have at least one Judas in our life. Maybe even more than just one Judas. This past week, I spent four days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 
with my dysfunctional family. But my dysfunctional family is a beautiful family. And my parents, who lived in Binghamton, New York for 38 years, we're all from Connecticut. When I was in college, the family moved to New York State. I didn't grow up there, but that, that was home for me for 38 years. My parents realized that they could not do it on their own anymore. They're not nursing home material, but they can't live on their own. They need help. So they joined forces with my niece and nephew in uh, just outside of Phoenix, in one of the sur uh, suburbs there. And it's a beautiful situation. So I left Easter Sunday afternoon to fly out of San Antonio on Monday morning to help my parents unpack and to help them with their financial and legal matters since I'm the oldest son. My sister and brother-in-law have been divorced for many, 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 many years. And whenever I do go to Phoenix, I always reach out to my brother-in-law because I love him and he's my friend. And yet, my sister has issues with me reaching out to my brother-in-law because she said, well, I'm divorced. And I said, well, I'm not divorced. <laughs> I'm not divorced. Well, what about this and what about that? It always takes two to tango. And so, where's the forgiveness? So my brother-in-law, knowing that I was coming into town and knowing that my parents had just arrived two weeks earlier, organized with his new wife, they're married in the church, very active in the Catholic Church, they organized this amazing dinner, the best Italian restaurant in Phoenix. And we laughed. You have to tell stories only. There's healing by just being with your family and reaching out to them and hugging them and embracing them listen and knowing how to move forward always through forgiveness before I left always when there's divorce there's the weight of a lot of suffering in the children and the oldest boy Tommy is a wonderful man great counselor he's a psychologist a counselor very accomplished helping lots of people and so before I left we had a, a little sandwich at the Panera with my mom and dad and Tommy, and we started talking about the family. And so what happened was, in 1978, I graduated, I, I graduated from college, and right after college, I joined a religious order called the Legionnaires of Christ. Well, I was away from my dysfunctional family for many, 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 many years. I was in Spain, I was in Spain for five. Rome for two, Mexico for six, all over the country. And so when I visited home, it was a couple of days, boom, I was the missionary, the brother, the, the uncle, missionary, in and out. And so I miss a lot of Tommy, Michael, and Christina's life. But now that's no, that's no longer the case. And so I apologize to Tommy for... for simply not being present as I would have liked to have been. But I was part of a religious order where I was all over the world. And I explained to Tommy, yes, our family is dysfunctional, but Jesus Christ called me to the largest, biggest dysfunctional family on the face of this map, which is the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is dysfunctional and wounded precisely because it is made up of 1.2 billion wounded human beings all over the world. But here's the good news. Jesus, true God and true man, Jesus the Lord, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus our Savior, died on the cross and rose from the dead and his resurrected and glorified body rose with his wounds intact precisely to show us that through his wounds we are all healed. But where is the risen and wounded Jesus? Where can we find him? As Jesus hung on the cross, all of his blood flowed from his wounds. 
The eternal reminder of his wounds reminds us that we are to experience him here in the Eucharist. This is the Jesus who stays with us. He remains with us. Even though he ascended to heaven, he loves us so much that he stays with us until his return in glory. It is in the Eucharist that we encounter peace because we truly encounter Jesus. It is in the Eucharist that we are renewed and, gain, and we gain new strength. It is in the Eucharist that we grow to love more and more. Don't wait for the crazy family member to call you or to visit you. You call the crazy person. You visit the crazy family member. You reach out to him or her. And don't ever worry if they're going to call you back or visit you. The love always takes the first step. Love is always the protagonist. This is why, my dear friends, as we have moved to a whole new level of spirituality in this parish since Good Friday, I invite all of you to fill this church for daily mass. I invite all of you to fill this church for adoration. I invite all of you to fill this church to visit the Blessed Sacrament every day. And let us learn on this Easter, this Easter Sunday, second Sunday after Easter. Let us be totally and completely convinced in the depths of our being that